Thank you for that kind introduction and good morning to everyone. I'm so pleased and honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today as we head into week two of this fantastic WE20 virtual conference. Before I begin, I wanna thank the Society of Women Engineers and everyone involved in the planning of WE20 for the wonderful job you've done with this conference. Despite the challenges of COVID-19, you've put together a fantastic event that's enabled us to engage and connect in a truly meaningful way. The Society had originally planned for us to gather in New Orleans. And while we're making the most of the current situation with this virtual conference, I can't help but wish we were all together in the Big Easy. And I'm not just saying that because we're missing out on the field trip to Pat O'Brien's. I wish we were together in New Orleans because that's where I first started with ExxonMobil. That was my first job right out of college when I graduated from Auburn University. The years I spent in New Orleans and the memories I have of that first job have left a big soft spot for that town in my heart. Those feelings have only intensified in the years since as I've watched New Orleans get beaten down by nature and tough times but the city itself and the people who call it home never quit. They always fight back and they always rebuild. And to me, New Orleans is the embodiment of how working together with others can get us through the tough times, can strengthen our personal resilience and make us capable of far more than we ever imagined. In our world today, having a support system of people you can count on is imperative. Throughout our lives, we all have challenges both personal and professional. Sometimes they shake our confidence and make us question our willingness and ability to keep striving to achieve. When dealing with challenges in my life, I relied on my resiliency honed and nurtured by the support, assistance, and guidance I've received from my family, my friends, colleagues at school, at work, or in my personal life to keep me moving forward. Today, I wanted to share some of those examples and lessons learned that I hope you'll find useful. Being resilient, being able to pick myself back up and keep going has been a key part of my life and career. Developing that inner strength is so critical for women in technical professions. Because despite our progress, many of us are still striving to redefine what it means to be a typical engineer. And we must constantly navigate around some of the deep-rooted cultural barriers that often exist for women in technical fields. My own resiliency was born from life experiences, really starting as a young girl. You know, my father was an engineer, and we weren't particularly well off. And so, for example, to save money, my mother used to make my clothes. Here's an uh, early photo of me in one of those handmade dresses. And because my dad was always looking for a better opportunity, we moved around a lot. And for me, that meant saying goodbye to friends, adjusting to a new city, a new school, again and again. And it wasn't easy. And it didn't help that I was a total introvert. I was the nerdy girl with the thick glasses wearing the homemade dress. Um, but out of necessity, I learned to build my own support systems. Because I was a new kid in school, and quite frankly, the kind of girl that people wouldn't otherwise notice, I realized early on that if I was going to have friends, it was up to me to make the first move. And that's what I did. In every town we moved to through the years, and, and just when I thought I was figuring it all out um, in high school, my world fell apart when I lost my mother. And it was, as you can imagine, a traumatic and extremely painful experience. Um, but my dad was my rock through all of it, and he still is today. And with his help and the help of other family members, my friends, their parents, my teachers at school, I made it through those days of sadness and uncertainty. And those childhood experiences sharpened my awareness of the connection between personal resiliency, the, the courage to pick yourself up and just keep moving forward, and the foundational stability that your personal networks can offer. I mean, because faced alone, even a small setback can be overwhelming. But if you take the time and effort to invest in the people around you, to gain their trust, to develop really meaningful relationships, you'll find the support and strength you need to overcome anything. In other words, you can do it all, and you can do it on your own terms, but you cannot do it alone. 
When it came time to me to go to college, I decided to major in chemical engineering because I excelled in math and science like many of you, and I had a natural curiosity about the way the world works. It seemed like a good fit. And when I got to Auburn, however, I found that I was just one of three women in most of my chemical engineering classes. And that was kind of a shock. Um, but I did what I had learned to do. I reached out and started building a support network. And since the two other women in chemical engineering also had names that began with the letter L, we called ourselves the L team. I know it sounds really weird, but we thought it was cool at the time. The L team was thrown into a situation that none of us were really prepared for, trying to find our way in an academic setting where most of the professors, all the students were men. And so I'm sure uh, they thought we might not make it, probably because we were women. Um, but it didn't take long for us, the Yale team, to develop a camaraderie that sustained us through the challenges of four years of chemical engineering work. We learned to lean on each other, encourage each other, support each other, and push each other. And, and here we are, all dressed up and ready to make our mark on the world. The fact that we had a support system made all the difference. It gave us the strength to be resilient, even when we were the most discouraged. Because of my experience at Auburn, I often tell people that increasing the number of women engineers requires us to do more than just funnel girls into engineering programs and hope for the best. Many of those students will reach their sophomore year and they'll feel all alone since they see so few women on their faculty or in their class. They'll realize that the workload they face limits their social life. They'll wonder whether it's all worth it and they'll start doubting themselves. And then, They'll change their major, which I've, if I'm being honest, I might have done too without the support of my L team buddies. We have to help women engineering students and young women engineers too to develop resiliency by building meaningful support networks so they can maintain that sense of purpose and belonging. The L team was fortunate that we had each other, but we need to do better for young women today. When you find yourself struggling, and we all do it at some point in our education or careers. Don't ever hesitate to seek help from a colleague, a friend, or a mentor. Never let external circumstances or other people take away your dream. In my first job based in New Orleans, I worked on one of our offshore production platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So imagine being 23 or 24 years old and being the only woman on a production platform that was miles from shore. One of the roughest, toughest work sites you could ever find. And even though the industry was trying hard to change its ways, the oil patch was no place for a lady back then. And those of us who were in the first wave of women engineers got the message in a number of subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways. And yeah, looking back, it's clear that I made all the mistakes that almost every woman in my generation in the industry made. When you're different from everyone else around you at work, your first instinct is to try your hardest to fit in with everyone else. And I was no different. I believed that the way to get along was to go along. And so I did what I saw people around me do. I behaved and worked the way I saw them behave and work. And if you're wondering, yes, I learned to cuss up a storm using a lot of words I'm sure I never even knew before I started working. And I learned to talk louder, to make myself heard, and I could yell, and I could stomp around when I got angry. But no matter how hard I tried, it just never felt right. That wasn't me. And then I had two sons in the span of a few years. And when I came back to work, I was exhausted all the time. I just didn't have the energy to try to be somebody other than who I was. And to be honest, I was comfortable enough in my own new mom skin to say, you know, if this work thing doesn't pan out, there's something else I could do that would be very fulfilling every day. And so I realized it was just time to be myself. And that was so liberating. For the first time, I felt like I could go to work, do my best, and not worry about whether I was fitting in or acting like I thought an engineer should act. And there's a lesson for you in this. Don't try and pretend to be something you're not. And don't doubt the ability of those people around you to accept you for who you are. We've come a long, long way since the 1980s. And your workplace will be better and more inclusive if you and your colleagues are genuine and honest with each other. During my senior year at Auburn, I met a gentleman from Exxon who recruited me. That recruiter, whose name is Leon Pace, ultimately became a mentor to me. 
He not only helped me immensely during my first few years on the job, he remained a trusted advisor as I moved up the ranks. And when I was inducted into the Alabama Engineering Hall of Fame earlier this year, Leon was by my side to celebrate. It was yet another example of how Leon has always been there for me with advice, assistance, and sometimes just a willingness to listen. I've tried to return that favor by helping others in the same way he helped me. It's a message I always stress when speaking with my ExxonMobil colleagues. None of us got to where we are by ourselves, and it's important to keep your eyes and ears open to identify someone less experienced who may be struggling. Pay it forward when you can. I'm proud of the way my colleagues at ExxonMobil recognize their role as women leaders. They understand intuitively that they have the ability and the responsibility to help others achieve success. Across ExxonMobil, we share a culture of growth and development that strives to lift all women, regardless of their job title or length of service. I mean, I'm living proof that ExxonMobil values the contributions of its women engineers and sees them as leaders and potential leaders. And I'm joined by many others who are changing the face of oil and gas. I'm DC Otan. I've known Linda uh, her entire career, ever since we worked together in New Orleans and we've worked together in Houston and we've supported each other all along the way through kids and different job assignments. Another source of support for me has been the Society of Women Engineers. I've been associated with SWE since college. They've provided mentorship opportunities, informal career um, advice, and family support. I was the president of the Georgia Tech Society of Women Engineers and got my first leadership training um, in that venue. And I made connections that I've had ever since college. I am very proud that ExxonMobil has been fully supportive of all my SWE activities as well as other similar organizations. And that's because ExxonMobil is deeply rooted in the support of diversity. And I think Linda and I are true examples of that. It's vital that women engineers in any company model successful behaviors and encourage other women to set their sights high and work hard to achieve goals. We have a responsibility to each other to push the boundaries of what it means to be a woman in a technical field. That's why I'm directly involved in two active employee resource groups at ExxonMobil, our Women's Interest Network and our Global Pride Group. Those groups do a great deal to help individual employees feel supported and engaged. When we talk about supporting women in engineering, we're really talking about inclusion. Everyone understands the importance of a diverse workforce and the necessity of outreach in our recruiting and hiring, but until everyone on your team feels included and valued, you're not really doing it right. You aren't gaining the full benefit of your diversity. That level of inclusion isn't just a nice to have, it's a necessity, particularly in this competitive environment we find ourselves in. Because no matter how skilled you are as an engineer, you will always accomplish more as part of a team with colleagues who have different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view. And you never know, the nerdy girl with the thick glasses just might surprise you. Just as individual women need others, so too do women as a group. We can't fully succeed without the support of our male colleagues. And I'm proud that ExxonMobil has such an outstanding record in that regard. This year, my colleague Raymond Jones, who serves as a vice president in our Upstream Integrated Solutions Group, was honored with the Society of Women Engineers prestigious Rodney D. Chip Memorial Award, which celebrates the work of a man or company who's made a significant contribution to the acceptance and advancement of women in engineering. Like my good friend Leon, Raymond is making a difference by supporting women at all stages of their careers. And he's in good company. Two other men from ExxonMobil have been honored with the CHIP Award in recent years. I am proud to call Raymond a friend and a colleague, and I'm thrilled that his commitment and efforts have been recognized by the Society of Women Engineers. Even today, after many years at ExxonMobil, I'm fortunate to have colleagues like Raymond and others who I can call upon for guidance and support. One thing I've noticed over the years is that women who are focused on their careers and families often struggle to develop support systems outside of their day-to-day -day work life. They're too busy to build or maintain relationships, yet they are so busy in part because they lack support. Your network can include a spouse or partner, family members, friends, neighbors, anyone you can turn to outside of work for camaraderie and support. 
And keep in mind, if you are constantly prioritizing your career over your loved ones, it won't end well in the long term. The word to remember is balance. Hey everyone, I'm Zach. Hi mom, I am Linda's son. Um, the other week, uh, I was traveling down to my alma mater to recruit and a senior manager knew of my mom and was asking, uh, you know, how does she do it? How does she uh, have time to uh, push her career, but also have time for her family? And my honest and genuine response was, I don't know. Um, I said this because I'd never realized that there was a juggling act going on in the background uh, the whole time I was growing up. And this is because uh, my mom made it so seamless. Uh, so two things really stuck out to me that my mom is great at. Uh, the first one being separation of work and family. And the second one being the quality of her support system. So the first one, um, the separation of work and family, uh, basically lends itself to she never brought her work stresses home. And then from my perspective, her work-life balance was 100% life and 0% work because I never saw that work side of it. Uh, it leads me into my second point, which was the quality of her support system. Um, and, and I mentioned quality because uh, she definitely wanted it quality over quantity. And that's because, you know, she had some uh, major asks of people throughout my upbringing. Um, on a few occasions, uh, me and my brother had to uh, stay at friends' houses. And, and I mean, when we were young, that's, that's a huge ask. Um, or carpooling to practice. Um, both asks that are, are met with open arms when you have a quality support system, um, especially with travel. Uh, that's something that she can't, uh, she can't change. If there's travel and work, then she's going to miss a basketball game. Um, but she always made up for it. Um, she would go out of her way to get off early the next week. So two major factors that led to a great upbringing for both my brother and me. Certainly, there are times when work takes precedence. I've had many of those situations in my career, and I know there will be more. That's a fact of life. But when work is over, it's critical that your loved ones remain a priority, even if you are thousands of miles away on assignment. A strong support system will make that easier. Build your personal networks. You'll need them. Let me share a personal story with you to illustrate this point. Earlier in my career, I was working in a London office and everything in my life was going great. Except I was really busy, multiple projects, travel, a husband, two young sons, and trying to maintain a household. And because of this, I missed a couple of doctor's annual visits. At one point, I was scheduled to come to Houston for a meeting and I took a flight over, but when I landed, I found out the meeting had been canceled. And I was so frustrated because I'd flown all the way over for nothing. But then I realized that with my free time, I could finally get in to see a doctor. And um, that's when I learned I had cancer. I'll spare you the details, um, but there are two morals to this story. One is always take time for yourself, no matter how busy you are. Don't put off your mammograms or your annual visits to the doctor. And don't ignore any warning signs about your health because you have meetings coming up or because your kids have activities scheduled. Put yourself first. Without good health, you can't be there for the ones you love and the people who count on you. The second lesson is that once I realized what I was facing, I joined a support group at work for women survivors of breast cancer. Again, you can't do it all alone. And those brave women mean the world to me because along with my family and friends, they gave me the strength and the support I needed to face my fears, to survive the grueling treatments and eventually to get back to work. Again, I was able to be resilient because I had encouragement and assistance from a network of people who cared about me and wanted me to succeed. One final point, it's important to have outside interests to keep you engaged and help clear your mind, such as volunteer activity or a sport you love. 
For me, running is a favorite activity. It helps me keep fit and enables me to stay sharp mentally. I love being out on a run, away from the challenges of the day, with my mind free to be creative. And it also gives me an opportunity to be out with friends and enjoying a competition or sharing a laugh. Um, that's another form of support that I've really come to appreciate. I truly hope that the lessons and experiences I've shared today have given you something to think about as you consider your own career aspirations and your relationships with others. Many women want to do it all, which is fantastic, but it's important to realize it can't be done alone. First, we need to be resilient with the grit and the courage to keep going regardless of how many times we get knocked down. And even with resiliency, we can't succeed without the support, encouragement, guidance, wisdom, and emotional strength that comes from our mentors, our colleagues, our friends, and those we love. The people you surround yourself with all add something to who you are and what you have to offer. And they each play a vital role in shaping your career and your life outside of work too. The more you embrace those around you, the more you give back to others, the stronger you become and the more successful you will be. In closing, I wanna thank the Society of Women Engineers for inviting me to share my thoughts with you today. And I appreciate your time and attention. I encourage you all to go do big things and live your best life. But remember that you need others to truly succeed.